my webinar and then Jack Kellogg uh, is doing a webinar right after uh, into the close. And I'm really excited because, you know, the, the market has been dropping rather consistently the past few days, but it's tough for any market or any stock to just keep going down when there's not like truly terrible news. Obviously like terrible companies, you know, most penny stocks when they're promoted and the promotion stops, they can keep going down. Um, I think that this is just like healthy consolidation in the overall markets because we're up so much. Um, and I think that all the good news might be priced in. I did that blog post two weeks ago saying why I think there will be a market sell-off and or crash. Um, filming this in mid-August, September and October are the two months of the year with the most crashes historically. So, you know, frankly, we, we need this. Like, we haven't had a big downtrend in so long. Um, and, you know, now it's, it's probably getting a little a little too much <clears throat> this morning when we took out the morning lows on the NASDAQ right here at around 1017. Taking out the morning lows, all the dip buyers were freaking out, but what happened, it came back. And I specifically said at that point, let me just show you, this is the beauty of timestamped commentary. Um, I'm not always gonna be right in my commentary and I'll, I'll get to what I've been wrong about in a second, but I was right about this. You know, when, when you're judging the overall market tanking, first of all, it's not an exact science. Second of all, you know, you're looking for that max panic on individual stocks. Very rarely do you get max panic on the overall market. Lots of squeezes. Oh, I said this um, at 1037. I said market bottoming nicely. Good chance that was that was the weekly bottom based on how much fear there is. So that was at 10.37 a.m. That was right like here. And it was because you, you kind of have this, you know, it's not a double bottom. It's not even a triple bottom. It's more like a quadruple bottom and it's ugly. You know, this is bottom number one, bottom number two, bottom number three, and bottom number four. Um, and ever since then, you know, we're in this kind of solid uptrend because you just don't get the major wipeout that people wanted. Why is that? First of all, again, you know, with the overall market, very tough to get a, a true panic or a true pandemonium. We've also been down, you know, today's Friday. This was Thursday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Monday. Monday was nicely up, but Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, like three big down days in a row. Um, very similar to, you know, penny stocks where you don't want to buy a stock up after three days. Usually after three days, the statistics flip and it's very difficult for a penny stock to keep going on day four. Same thing with the markets, um, especially like a major market index like the NASDAQ or the S&P 500. The S&P is actually, even though it's red on the day, it's a green candle because it's higher than where it opened. Um, it's just really tough to, to keep going down. So that's why I, I think that the market downtrending is good. I don't know if this is going to be the ultimate bottom. You know, the S&P has like a little bit of support here. The NASDAQ, I mean, I think we're just still so overextended, but it's really difficult to keep going down without any truly terrible news. So I'm a little bullish. Um, and I, I think that shorts are a little scared. You know, like we've seen a lot of short squeezes today. GNS, nice little short squeeze from under 90 cents to a buck 30. I mean, this is a 40% bounce. Tupperware had a nice squeeze from 210 uh, to 275. I mean, this is a 30% bounce. Uh, TTOO had a nice squeeze from 38 cents up to 51 cents. This is a 30% bounce. So just three stocks right there. And then also NEPT, you know, kept spiking quite nicely. And this, this follows the rule of many of these spikers this week um shorts are just getting crushed there's no other way to say it a lot of it is just over aggressive shorting um it's funny because i i see it you know i used to be a short seller and i don't short anymore i don't think newbies should short um and it's funny because i don't teach short selling anymore and the people who do teach short selling i think are very naive um, I think they're very irresponsible and I think it's very risky to, to be a newbie in shorting right now. So not that, you know, it, every short 
is terrible. Not that every play like is a buy. It's just very risky um, shorting anything where you have that potential for a giant squeeze. And a lot of the biggest shorts, in case you're wondering, some people will say, well, Tim, many of your top students are short sellers or short biased. Yes, but they have know-how, they have experience, and they have capital. They can outlast many squeezes. Newbies do not have experience, do not have capital, and do not have know-how. So, you know, in, in all of the attributes that my top students have, which is working for them shorting, and not all of them are banking huge, but at least they have better odds when they're shorting, you don't. Does that make sense? Say yes or no, I'm curious. I see uh, WeWorks is trying to spike a little bit too. It's just such a bad company. It had a nice squeeze earlier this week. You can't rely on any of these squeezes to last too long. I'm very excited to see these squeezes. Like I, I played Nept pretty well on this spike and the squeeze, um, but you, you can't overstay and you can't expect too much. FFIE also had uh, you know some spiking a few days ago. A lot of these like junkers that are just like priced for, you know, nothing. <laughs> They're priced for bankruptcy. Wow, was it more than 20 days ago? Well, maybe it was in here. Yeah, I mean, it was back in July and it squeezed up for several days from 18 cents up to 34 cents. I mean, this is a double in a few days. Uh, INPX also had some spiking right here. You know, so it's okay to, to play the spikes. It's okay to understand the short squeezes. Just don't overstay. I, I feel like I, I have to guard against everything, right? I have to guard newbies from holding and hoping and actually believing in these companies. I have to guard against short sellers being too aggressive. Um, there's a lot of money to be made if you just are meticulous and, you know, you take small gains. And obviously, you know, I'm not, uh, the, the best one to talk right now, I'm still trading way too small, um, you know, barely green on the year, just like I was barely green last year. And that's fine. You know, I, I, I admit to my mistakes. Um, I'm still up quadruple off my lows just uh, basically two months ago when I got really undisciplined in uh, May and June. So you have to take victories wherever you can. It's not just about making the most money. I think this industry is really screwed up because people focus on, you know, trying to, to post the biggest screenshots. They don't like to show their losses. Everybody is like looking for respect. And for me, I mean, I'm like Rodney Dangerfield. I can't get no respect. It doesn't matter how many millions I make trading. It doesn't matter how many millionaires I create. I've just accepted it, you know? Maybe it's my personality, maybe it's, it's penny stocks, um, you know, it's, it's just, I've accepted it. And, and it's a good thing because I'm not going for respect, I'm just going to be as useful for you as possible. Um, you know, that's my, my honor in life and I think it's good. So while I'm not up that much in 2023, I've really gotten disciplined. Um, I, you know, I had my worst loss. The $27,000 loss was my worst loss in over a decade. That's how careful I've been. Not that I didn't have any profits. Like literally, if you look at all of my trades over the past decade, I did not have any loss bigger than $6,000. All while I'm making what, you know, you can, you can see every trade. This is the beautiful thing. Um, I can do a custom, custom scan over the past decade from August 18th, 2013 to August 8th, 2023. I've made $4.3 million without a loss of more than $6,000. That's phenomenal, okay? And I'm not trying to toot my own horn. I'm just trying to help you understand that I really have done a good job cutting losses until a few weeks ago. And you can see here, you can sort all my gains some of my gains, you know, I'm making 60,000 a few times, 30,000 a few times, but no big losses until I just, you know, had a, a, a terrible 
terrible loss. Look at this, $27,000. Okay, back in 2014, sorry. 2014, I had a $20,000 loss and I made a $15,000 loss. So no big losses in nine years. Still pretty amazing. Uh, 2014 was a rough year for me. I, I had some, some big losses, 22, 15, 14, 14, 13. 2013, I lost 11, 11. But notice, nothing 2022, nothing 2021, nothing 2020, 2019, 2018, 2017, 2016, 15, okay? All of these losses are 2013 and 14 until my biggest loss when I just got so undisciplined. And it's a good wake up call. If you ever have a big loss, you start to see, wow, wait a minute, I see what I'm risking. And that $27,000 loss could have been much worse had I not cut losses quickly. I just sized in too much and ignored all my rules. But look at all these losses, they're all 2014. And by the way, you know, in case you wanna say like, wow, Tim, you sucked in 2014. Yes, I did, but let me just change this so you can see what I did in 2014. Let's see, even though I had a bunch of losses, I also was trading, I remember, with big size. So sometimes when you trade with big size, you're gonna have big losses. But for 2014, I still made over 800 grand, okay? So think about that. All of my losses, all of my biggest losses, up until this one big loss, um, you know, I was, I was losing very small for the past nine years. 2014 was amazing. Um, part of the reason why I had an $800,000 year in 2014, just in case you were wondering, um, two really big trades, EKSO. This was when I was on the TV show Below Deck and I was trading bigger for the cameras. They got the $70,000 profit on camera. They did not show it, unfortunately. So you might see me on Below Deck walking around the ship feeling great because they had just captured one of my best trades of all time live on camera. The Wi-Fi wasn't even working. I called it in. I specifically went bigger for the show. Um, and I, I wish that they did show it because this was a beautiful trade. But this is why I was trading big, specifically for the TV show. And then CNTO was a perfect pump that I was shorting. And, and there were actually shares to short. Um, so, you know, these two trades are a good example of why I was trading so big in 2014. Um, it was really beautiful. Back then, what was it called? Seeking Alpha Pro? I think it was Seeking Alpha Pro it was like a, a, a newsletter that had just come out and it was really good. I think I paid like two or $3,000 for the year just for, for access to it. Now it sucks. Seeking Alpha sucks completely. It's useless. But in 2014, I don't know who they had writing, um, but it was amazing. And that's how I made nearly a million. This was actually my best year until 2020, 2021. You might not realize it, but I had never made a million dollars in any one trading year up until you know two and three years ago. Uh, this was my best year ever. But anyways, even though I had a big year, I also had lots of losses. And that's why I'm, I'm really excited to teach you how to trade like a coward. Like if you look at 2020, you know, tough year for the world, right? I made over a million dollars. But if you look at my trades, I made 1.2 million. If you look at my trades, no truly huge trades, like 23,000, 16, 16, 16 for gains. But look at my losses, negative 5,000, negative 4,000, negative 2,000. So compare that to 2014 when I still made nearly a million, but I had so many 10, 15, $20,000 losses. I choose smaller losses every time. Obviously 2020, very unique time in history. Um, 2021, it's good to go back and look through your trades. You, you can do this too if you upload all your trades. 2021, I also made over a million. And if you look at my biggest losses, 6,000, 5,000, 4,000, 3,000. And this $6,000 loss, I still remember it. Um, I was actually giving a challenge webinar. Uh, you could probably watch this. This was on January 6th, 2021, uh, the Capitol riots on January 6th. And LLLI was a defense play. And I thought that the riots would keep going overnight, maybe spread overnight, spread into other cities. Um, that was the play. That's why you, you buy a, a defense stock overnight. 
I'm glad that I was wrong, that you know there was no more violence on January 7th or January 8th. Um, but I had a $4,000 loss or a $4,000 gain on this before I went long overnight and I, I turned my gain into a loss. So this was me just being a little risky. But aside from that, I still didn't have any big losses. Now, fast forward to 2023, eight months in, and I've had my biggest loss in over a decade, and I'm barely making any money because that big loss really scared me. Um, I threw away all my rules. I threw away my sizing. I always tell you guys from stocks to trade breaking news. Had I simply looked at stocks to trade breaking news, I should never have been in the position anyways. They had just done a financing. So I, I broke all my rules right away. And that, that's the risk. So I'm still, uh, I'm still reeling from that, frankly. By the way, Jack Kellogg, I think he's still in TQQQ. Um, this goes against, um, you know, this is a, a leveraged ETF. And I think he's in from like 30, the mid 35s. And he's, he's expecting that it's a bottom. And, you know, I, I think it's, it might be a good bet because we are oversold with the, the overall markets. Any questions, throw them out. I'll be answering questions for the next hour or so. Is TTOO forming consolidation near high of the day? Is it still considered choppiness? So I have to say something because I said like, you know, I would not focus on TTOO um, this morning. I didn't think that it was going to squeeze that much, frankly. I thought that, you know, 38 to like, I think I said it when I wouldn't trade it. I think it was like when it was like 46 and it was up, you know, 15% and it didn't look like it was going to spike big. And I was like, guys, stop playing these, these, these stocks that don't have a lot of range. And I was trading NEPT, which at the time, you know, was up over a hundred percent. So if you ask which stock am I going to focus on, I'll always go with the hundred percent runner. Um, I think that, that you should learn to focus on, you know, the, the more volatile plays. Um, TTOO kept going though, uh, interestingly enough. So, um, I was wrong, you know, I admit it. Any PT had the more volatility, but I'm just not excited how it's acting right now. TTOO is actually holding its gains and it spiked more than I thought. Um, so, you know, sometimes I'm just going to be wrong. Props to Art of War. He nailed it. He was also asking, how do you know if it's a short squeeze or a first green day? I mean, the short squeeze leads to the first green day. Um, I'm just not a big fan of, of short squeezes way off their highs. Um, you know, I, I know Tupperware squeezed a little bit too. And so like these short squeezes can turn into first green days, but it's really tough to get a giant short squeeze. Um, for me, if I'm trading a short squeeze stock, I want it to be near the intraday highs and the multi-day highs. Why? Because then it can really squeeze. So when you have these, these hard like multi-day downtrends and you get like a little bit of a squeeze, it worked for Tupperware, it worked for TTOO. I'm just not gonna, you're not gonna see me buy those. Cause you know, for me, a, a short squeeze is all about, can it really go supernova? And when you you have a stock down this much over several days, it's just not gonna, you know, go huge. There's just too much resistance. So is it consolidating near the high of the day? Is it choppy? I don't care. Like it's, it's just not my pattern right now. Maybe it's a first green day. Maybe it comes back. I mean, this is kind of like the, the whole market right now. Um, I'm really just extra careful with these. And, and the same thing with GNS, like GNS is coming back. You can say it's a first green day. Maybe, you know, I'm, I, by the way, the NASDAQ is still red on the day. So maybe we finish higher. Maybe we finish green by the end of the day. We still have like three hours left. Um, it's just really tough for me to get excited uh, about something that has already bounced so much and it's not anywhere near the highs. So the, the probability of a giant squeeze is very low. Um, let's say smog dog says, so this is private. Well, 
this is a public webinar, so now it's public. Uh, I just need to say I love Bowen as a coach. He's awesome. I love you both, and both are amazing. But every time you dip by, he doesn't say your name, but says dip buyers are trying to guess the bottom. I know you're the master, so I wanted to bring it to your attention. Look, we all trade differently, okay? And we all live differently. He also kills thousands of animals for fun just out of sheer boredom in Michigan. I disapprove of that. Um, you can trade the way you want. You can live the way that you want. We're all going to be different. And I know that might be confusing to some of you because you want like uniformity in the rules, but I actually like the differences. Um, I wish that, you know, I could teach Tim Bowen compassion, but I think that he just drinks too much coffee. So no matter what I taught him, you know, it would just like, he would just piss it out. Like he pisses out all the coffee. So I don't think I can teach him, but I like the way that he teaches. I think it's very useful. Try and learn a little something from every single one of your mentors. You know, Ellis did a great job today with, uh, I think he traded Tupperware and TTOO and I traded neither, but I did a good job on NEPT. Um, you're gonna try to see what works for you. And, and sometimes you're gonna really jive with a mentor. You're gonna really like a strategy. Sometimes you won't. You know, a lot of my top students are hardcore short sellers. And every third word out of my mouth in 2023 is like, don't short sell. You think they like it? No, they think that I'm like betraying them or turning my back on them. I just see short selling as a gigantic risky strategy for newbies. So you really have to start to learn all the different angles. There's a reason why I say what I do, why I teach the way that I teach. Do I just want to piss off all the short sellers in the world? No, but frankly, they're miserable, toxic lepers. So they're going to be pissed off at anything. Like if, you know, there's traffic, they're just going to get overly negative. I think it also, aside from shorting being risky, and again, because I've made millions of dollars shorting and I know the industry, um, it's a very tough way to live. If you look at a lot of the short sellers these days, they might be my same age. They look like freaking Gandalf. Okay. And not like Gandalf prequel action. I'm talking about Gandalf, like the gray Gandalf, the white. Um, why is that? Why do I look younger and they look like death? Because they're always betting on failure. They're always looking for the worst of the worst. It's, it's like viewing the world through this negative lens. And trust me, they're not wrong. A lot of these companies are scams. They will drop and they'll be right the majority of the time. And so they'll say, Tim, why are you saying don't short sell? All these companies do drop eventually. And I agree, they do drop eventually, but it's a miserable way to live looking for failure, having to get up for borrows. If you're a morning person, maybe you like short selling. I'm not a morning person. I don't wanna get up at three, four, five in the morning every day looking for locates, but that's what short sellers do. So learn from short sellers, learn from me. Just understand that it's in my own best interest to teach you how to become a millionaire. Once you're a millionaire, you can do whatever you want. But until you're a millionaire, try to understand why I'm saying this. I'm trying to protect you. I'm trying to keep you in the game. Even some of my top students who are millionaires and multimillionaires, they've lost six and seven figures on some of these squeezes this year. They're not masters of risk. They might've made a lot of money, but they're all just one trade away from blowing up and losing all their money, okay? I saw this, who, I forget what, what, which stock it was. There was some giant squeeze a few weeks ago and there was a short seller, like now with Twitter, you can do like these long tweets and there was a, a tweet from a, you know, a career short seller and he got very introspective about the risk reward and all of this stuff. And it was like the longest tweet ever. And I was just thinking in my head, like it was all about how, you know, you're one trade away from blowing up. Like he knew traders who have lost years or decades of hard work in one trade. And I'm, and he's still justifying short selling. And I was like, you gotta be, a, you gotta be such an, an a, I don't even know what the word is. You have to be just blind. That's probably the best word. You have to be blind to think that you're risking losing years, if not decades of hard work, shorting a play. And because you feel like you, you need to bet against the stock because you feel the need that you need to be a part of, of it dropping, you're going to risk all your hard work over years. Like that's just stupid, but you know, the short sellers love it. 
Tupperware, um, you know, you have these squeezes. And this is how short squeezes spike, by the way. Some people are like, how do you know how many shorts? I don't know exactly how many shorts. The good news with short sellers is they're like angry vegans. You ask like an angry vegan, if you meet them, you're like, hey, nice to meet you, I'm Tim. And they're like, hey, I'm Chrissy, I'm a vegan. And I'm like, I, I didn't ask what you were, but they just can't help it because they think that they're so noble and they're so much better than others. Short sellers are the same way, right? With short sellers, it's like, hey, I'm Dave, I'm a short seller. It's like part of their character. They take so much pride in it. And I'm like, oh, you're a short seller? So you like risking blowing up every day just to feel a little alive because you're a toxic leper who lives in your mom's basement and you like getting up at four in the morning to try to find locates and pay brokers far too much money and take on too much risk just for the adrenaline rush? Nice to meet you, you know? You don't have to take big risks to make big money. That's a, a huge rule. A lot of them just like it because it's very logical. Like, oh, this company's a scam. I can read the fundamentals. I can read their SEC filings. I can spot the scam. You feel like a detective. And then it comes down and you're like, there's justice in the world. And it jives with your worldview. That still doesn't make it a good strategy, especially with the squeezes these days. So that's my take on short selling. But, you know, again, feel free to do it if you want. Just don't say I didn't warn you. And with Tim Bowen not liking my dip buys, I mean, if you look at my old DVDs, I say don't dip buy. Like, you got to adapt and, and you find what works for you. I don't care if it doesn't work for Tim Bowen, right? Again, like he could hand me seven weapons and line up 10 innocent animals and he'll say go to work and I just won't feel comfortable. He'll feel right at home because he has that bloodlust. I don't. Um, thoughts on FMCC and Fannie Mae spiking? You know, I mean, these are former supernovas. Um, I just don't think that big companies right now are, are really my cup of tea. Um, I like this multi-day spike, but I, I saw it. It wasn't on my watch list. Like, you know, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, they don't always follow the same rules. And you can see this giant panic from 90 cents to 70 cents. It bounced a little. You got a 10% bounce. Um, but really just not, not enough bounce and not enough volatility for me. You know, I really wish I wasn't flying earlier this week. TTOO, beautiful uptrend, beautiful panic. This is like the, the setup that dreams are made of for me. And I missed it because I was traveling and that sucks. Traveling protects me from overtrading, but sometimes, you know, and you, you can't time it. I was talking actually with uh, Kyle and Huddy, two, you know, short biased millionaire students of mine. And, you know, we were just talking and I was like, the day before, you know, the market even opened, I was doing my watch list at night in the middle of the night and I knew I was flying all day. And I said, you know, enjoy TTOO. And they were like, how did you know? I, I didn't know that it would be such a perfect panic and bounce. I just had an idea that there would be enough range to trade. Um... Let's see. Watch that episode with my wife who always watches. Well, I was on Below Deck twice. Um, the first episode, you know, was the one where I made the 70 grand. Everyone's wearing, you know, TimothySykes.com t-shirts. We had the great trade on, um, you know, on camera. They sucked with no Wi-Fi. They screwed up all the food. So I took away half their tip and it made me like the show villain. I was on it again, second time left the biggest tip in show history. Everything went very smoothly. Um, I wasn't trading big because I knew that even if I did trade big, they wouldn't show it. Um, but we all had a good time. And, and, you know, I was proud to leave the biggest tip and they never aired that one where I'm the good guy. It's always like the villains. So I just accept it. Uh, what did you use the newsletter for? Just finding pumps or short reports? Um, I mean, back in 2014, I was a short bias trader, but... The newsletter uh, that they had, you know, they, they really just like, they basically pumped up stocks, um, you know, because the, I don't know that I think they had, I, I think they had a, a distribution deal with Yahoo Finance at the time. They later screwed it up. But at the time, Yahoo Finance was this big website for finance. It was like the only website and Seeking Alpha articles would pop up in the news. And you wouldn't be able to read them. They had like a little dollar sign for like a premium access. Um, 
But, you know, the titles were clear. It was like, I remember I was trading YOD, You On Demand, which later got, they changed their ticker. But the, the, the headline was something like, this is the, the new Disney of China. And I was like, or the Netflix of China. Yeah, I think it was the Netflix of China. And it was like this dollar or $2 stock. And you couldn't read the article unless you were a Seeking Alpha Pro member. But with a headline like that, it doesn't take a genius to see that this stock is going to spike big. Um, and I remember YOD at the time spiked quite nicely. And that was the same thing with, with EKSO and CNTO. Um, that's why it's such a big year. So, you know, this is why it's funny. Like some people bitch and moan. They don't want to pay a few thousand dollars for any service. And I'm just thinking like if you only knew how much upside potential there was. Like in 2014, Seeking Alpha Pro, they could have charged me 50,000 and I would have paid it. Cause I, again, I made like out of the 900,000 I made that year, it wasn't a perfect science, but I would say probably half, maybe half was due to Seeking Alpha Pro. So if you're gonna say, look, you have to pay $50,000 for the year for this service, but you're gonna make 400,000, I would do it every time. Same thing with the challenge. Like you guys have such a great deal. It always blows my mind when someone's like, I don't want to pay for education. And I'm like, with that mindset, you're going to be poor your entire life because you don't value education. And because you, you think that by saving some time and some money and you're spending it out at like nightclubs or whatever, you know, there's a million things to spend your money on, but things that don't help you in the long run, it blows my mind. But I also have to understand that, you know, some people are just helpless. So I'm glad that you guys took the time, you take your education seriously, and you invest it. And aside from like Seeking Alpha Pro, you know, just pumping up stocks, the challenge is education. And this is why I'm so proud that we have a diverse range of mentors, whether, you know, it's Ellis who likes these short squeezes, whether it's Tim Bowen who likes, you know, murdering innocent animals, whether it's me who likes dip buying and saving newbies from themselves, um, whether it's Mark Crook who likes to use options using my framework, whether it's Tim Lento who loves you know short selling and has been quiet because he knows that if he opens his mouth, I'm just going to rip on anything that he thinks and says. Um, let's see. The below deck crew should have showed you guys way more respect. I mean, the, the funny thing though, is like the below deck crew and I, and everyone, we all got along. Like the crew was awesome to us. Um, you know, the, the interviews were just right after I tipped and because I took back half the tip in, in, on front of the camera, like that probably wasn't the smartest idea for me to do that right before they do interviews. Um, but aside from the interviews, you know, we always like got along and I still talk to like half the crew Tupperware, ideally higher lows and an afternoon breakout. Again, be very careful with these short squeeze stocks. Okay. They might be up off their lows, but look at the 10 day trend on Tupperware. Okay. This is not a good trend. You, you might get a little bit of a squeeze. You might get a little bit of a breakout, but you're not going to get a giant short squeeze unless there's news and you're fighting this trend. This is the problem, okay? When I'm trading a short squeeze stock, I want it to be at or near the highs because then it can really squeeze. It's really tough to change the trend, especially when it's like a two week trend. You catch a few shorts off guard, but this big spike from like three to six, this was news based. This is not, this is just like the stock being oversold. Uh, let's see. PR nice price action. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's nice if you're boring. I'm just not boring and I'm, I'm not into boring setups like that. I've noticed you're in and out of trades pretty quickly. If a stock is trading sideways, do you find it too risky to stay in? Yeah, I mean, I'm just like extra careful these days. You know, it's if you look through my past decade, I've always been really scared. You know, there's a saying like scared money doesn't make money, but I've literally made over four million dollars by trading scared. So I think you can trade scared. A lot of these um, 
a lot of these um, stocks are just so volatile and it's scary. Am I having dinner with challenge students? Oh, we have a VIP dinner at the Vegas conference. Um, if you email admin at timothysykes.com, uh, my team can tell you how to get in on that. Who's coming to Vegas? Say yes if you're coming to Vegas, October 26th and 27th. I'm curious. Smog Dog says, I love Bowen and I'm in every STT Pro webinar. Listen, I love the way that he teaches too. Um, you know, for his birthday, I think I'm just going to get him some compassion training and we'll see if he uses it. Uh, TTOO bought at 417, sold at 425 way too soon. But that's fine. It's listen, you're, you're, you're trading these low odds setups and you wonder why you don't have confidence in them. I wouldn't have confidence in that kind of a setup either. GSMG had a PR announcing $20 million investment at 248. Why would anybody buy at 248 if it's trading under a dollar? So, you know, this is a good question. G GSMG, you know, again, they, they try to spike their stocks with these investments at key levels or specific prices. Why would anybody, you know, pay double or triple? They're trying to make a statement. They're trying to pop the stock. Um, as you see, it popped for a little bit. Same thing with DTSS. It, it popped for a little bit. They did a financing at a buck thirty-five. Um, you know, again, be very careful with these financings up or down. There's a lot of stuff happening behind the scenes. It's not just they put out the headline, but like, you know, you might see a CEO buy some shares of his stock and everyone's like, oh, look at the CEO believes in the stock. But he might just be buying a little bit of stock just so that, you know, he can make people think that he's believing in the company. Meanwhile, like someone he knows or some hedge fund that he associates with are selling their entire stake into the pop. So just just be very dubious of, of any headlines. Um, Tim, I know you said you don't like dip buying in the afternoon at the last conferences that still stand. I mean, if you just watch my last like 20 video lessons, you, you probably shouldn't dip buy in the afternoon. Um, the best bounces and the best spikes are near the market open. That's what happens. Uh, would you say the recent crash is over and this crash was caused by the credit system downgrade? I mean, this isn't a crash, first of all. You guys are fortunate not to know what a crash is yet. Um, I don't know, you know, what's causing this, this downtrend. I, I think, yeah, there's a credit downgrade. We're overextended. Um, you know, China, like the, their whole economy is imploding. NVIDIA, like 40% of their business is from China. So the strongest stock in the market might be at risk to have a, an imploding business soon too. I think there's a lot of risks, but we're just overextended. You know, when the NASDAQ is up 30, 40% on the year, be careful. I laughed my ass off when you broke that tip in half. Yeah, I mean, look, I, for, I, I had fun with, you know, the below deck crew. And I was just like messing with them too, but they also sucked. Um, you know, that first trip, they were, they were really screwing everything up and it wasn't just us. I, I talked to other guests, you know, they were trying to be dramatic and trying to cause problems for the guests. In case you don't know, if you go on below deck, it's like a normal yacht charter, but you get 50% off. So I paid roughly 70 grand to be on the yacht for a few days for me and several of my students. Um, and it was cool. But, you know, it's kind of interesting that I made, you know, totally randomly 70 grand on that one trade. So I basically got a free yacht trip. Um, but they, they cut it in half price wise because it's being filmed for TV and they need to make it dramatic. By season five, when I went on for the second time, they treated everyone so much better because they realized that creating problems in drama doesn't lead to repeat guests. They were really struggling to get any repeat guests. Um, let's see. Rams 46 says, well said about education. See you in Vegas. Mm -hmm. 
The conference itinerary will be out soon. Just try to get there as early as possible. Uh, let's see. Agent might be worth watching billionaire play. Yeah, I mean, Agent was a billionaire play yesterday. Okay, the news came out yesterday. It's actually pretty amazing that it's popping today. Um, a delayed reaction. Agent and what was it? PRAX. Stevie Cohen is doing both. And it's interesting, it's been a while since these plays, you know, when you have a billionaire investing have really spiked. But look, I, I welcome, um, you know, billionaire plays again. Let me get rid of RGTI. That one is boring. I'll add PRAX. I'll get rid of DRTS. That's boring too. If you go through my DVDs and video lessons, I mean... A while ago, it was years ago, but I used to buy billionaire plays and they would run for several days, if not weeks. Any recommendations about getting over my fear to enter the morning dips? I wait till the price seems to have reached the bottom, but I always think the price will tank. I'm so bad at sticking to my stop loss. I mean, it's just practice. You're, you're one month into the challenge. I mean, only TTOO really was the perfect morning panic and bounce. Um, you know, morning panics just haven't been that hot lately. So I, I would be nervous too. You guys want to be confident when the plays aren't solid and that's just not reality. Like you need solid plays to gain confidence and you need to see solid play after solid play. Chris Cruz is coming to Vegas. Mom of Wall Street coming to Vegas. Philip Hampton coming to Vegas. JTN4 coming to Vegas. Celso's coming to Vegas. El Coke is coming. Dylan's coming. Rams 46. Hertz is coming. Gary's coming. Brandon's coming. Uh, Pinkston is coming to Vegas. Kim's Got This is coming to Vegas. I'm pumped to see all of you. I'm, I'm pumped to trade live and it's, it's going to be pretty amazing. Tim, I'm watching IONM trying to learn and understand patterns. Thoughts on this stock? I O N M. I mean, there's no, there's nothing like it's a percent gainer today, but it has such a terrible long-term chart. I, I really want you guys focusing on, you know, multi-day runners. Um, you can get these quick spikers. If I had to guess, it's just because it spiked real quick and then it dropped. And then, you know, a few people were shorting it again today because they're like, oh, it's going to spike and then drop again. And then it didn't. You really have to understand how much of this market is controlled by short sellers and, and the action is controlled by short sellers. So anything that's up, especially when it has such a bad long-term uh, chart, it's probably just a short squeeze. And, and it's really difficult for me to trade any short squeeze so far away from the top. It's like a 50-50 setup, whether it's going to keep going or not. Uh, let's see. Shade Tree Trading is coming to Vegas. J Ray is coming to Vegas. Awesome, J Ray. I know you've been on fire. Congrats, ever. Please congratulate J Ray. They just crossed a hundred thousand dollars in profits. Coffee break still working on your schedule. Um, Prax. Now I can't understand how I can manage to screw up every long trade, but it's fine. Look, you guys. Again, you want success, you want confidence, you have to realize it doesn't matter if you have success or confidence in the beginning. Because even if you have success in the beginning, you just got lucky, you'll probably screw it up. If you get confidence in the beginning of your journey, you're just gonna screw it up and you're gonna lose it. So don't expect to have confidence or success in the beginning. It's okay to screw up. It's okay to sell too soon. It's okay to miss. It's okay to cut losses and then have a perfect gain. All of this is part of your checklist that you need to check off all of these lessons one by one so that you better understand this game and then you're better prepared year two, year three, year four. You know, it's, it's crazy to me how many times I say it, but it, it's only human nature to want success right away and you want to make money to prove to yourself and to prove to me and to prove to everybody. But prove you ain't got nothing to prove to nobody but yourself. And if you ain't done that by now, it ain't going to never happen. Sorry, I have to quote Rudy every now and then. But the point is, is that it doesn't matter what you do in the beginning of your education. 
You know, like this, this woe is me type comment. Oh, I managed to screw up every trade. Good. Screw up every trade. Keep screwing it up. Keep learning what not to do. Maybe next time you're going to do something, you're going to take a second and look at your thumb before it hits the key. And you're going to be like, nope, I've screwed up doing this 17 times in a row. Let me see what happens when I don't do that. And then you take your thumb or your finger away from the key and then you do the opposite. And then because you have that experience of 17 screw ups in a row in this hypothetical example, you now have the confidence to do something different. So no screw up is bad. It's all part of your education. You need all those screw ups in order to get to the other side. Just because you think that you're screwing up and it's a bad thing doesn't mean that it's an actual bad thing. You just don't have perspective. I do. That's why I'm here for you. Any screw up, any loss, any gain, it all adds to your experience. If you have gain, 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 I'm worried about you because you're getting too cocky, you're crushing it, but you're probably going to lose big. And no matter what I try to teach you to be conservative, to cut losses quickly, you're just going to ignore me because you've had too much success. And then the market is going to come in to teach you. You either listen to me or you listen to the market. There's no other way, right? And it's not like I'm right every time, but I'm, I'm, I'm right a, a very good amount of time when I'm teaching this to you newbies. Um, so you can ignore me. You can say, ah, oh, Sykes is past his prime. You know, like he's, he's obsolete. I don't need his lessons. If you've done too well, if you made too much money in a short term. I had a friend and she was, she was learning um, no names because I'm not looking to, to rip on anybody, but this, this crazy, crazy trader who I've known for years and they have a prop firm and they just try to lure people into trades for the prop firm because they make money on, on every trade that you do with the commissions. They don't care whether you win or lose. They just want you trading. They'll offer you ridiculous leverage, um, trading, trading, trading. And they realize that 90% of traders lose. So if you lose, who cares? Like you're just fitting into the majority. Anyways, my friend went with this prop firm trader and I was like, you know, trying to warn her. I was like, you know, this, this is not a good thing. You're just going to lose big. They just want your commissions. And she's like, no, you don't understand. And I'm like, okay, she didn't listen to me. I think it's been like three months. And she's like, you were a hundred percent right. How did you know? Cause I've been doing this for a freaking quarter of a century. Ah, uh, let's see. Siemens Geld, Vegas. No, the first no. What's going on, Siemens Geld? Why can't you come to Vegas? For us with cash accounts and can't get back into trades as easily if it initially doesn't go our way, do you think we should start with small size and average down? No, I don't like averaging down. You never, just like, you know, newbies can't outlast a short squeeze. Most newbies can't outlast a downtrend. You know, imagine if, if you're buying Nvidia and you're like, oh, it's the strongest stock and you know, day one, day two, day three, and then day four it panics and you give up here. And then day four is actually when it bounces. Just as an example, um, do not average in or average out. Or, you know, again, ignore my rules, go against what I'm trying to teach you, average in, average out, learn the hard way. Either way, you're gonna have to learn. But I'm trying to speed up your learning curve so that you don't have to learn from the market because the market is a lot less uh, compassionate and, and it's far more unpleasant to learn from the markets. Uh, Linal 3N, yes to Vegas. Cool. TTOO, new high of the day. Whoa, I've been answering questions and I missed it. You know, again, I'm still just not excited about this. It did make a new high of the day from, you know, 51.3 to 53.3. Okay, you got your two cents a share breakout. And then what? You know, it's just, it's really tough, really tough to chase a stock like this. Um, and, I, you know, again, I was wrong. It was a good buy near the open, but it's a very different stock in the 30s compared to the 50s. And we're not guaranteed to finish strong this week. You know, the Dow did go green and now the Dow is turning red again too. So 
I just wouldn't expect anything. And if this if this bounce fails and we actually close weak, you know, we might get some absolute panic because if they, you know, fake out all the dip buyers today, I don't think that's going to happen. I think that we are oversold, but it could happen. You know, I, I've just learned to expect anything, absolutely anything. So if you're asking, how do I trade this random short squeeze stock that's way off its highs? I don't know because it doesn't fit my patterns. P. Newman says, LOL, I got confident and screwed up badly. Well, you know, at least you can admit it. You know, you can admit it to yourself. You can admit it to us. Um, if you ever screw up with a small loss, with a big loss, again, it's part of your education. Nothing you do that at least still keeps you in the game matters in the beginning. If you blow up and you lose all your money, you lose all your money and you owe your broker and you're out of the game, that does matter because then you can't learn. You can't learn if you don't play. Um, but if you're in the game and you have a nasty loss, remember it, write it down. You know, part of the reason why I like talking about this $27,000 loss, because it's a great lesson for so many of you. And it's a good reminder for me. I've been doing this a quarter of a century. I really know this stuff. But even I, master in my own mind, cocky in my own mind, when you get too cocky, it's a very slippery slope. And the market needed to teach me this lesson. And I'm an infinitely better trader as a result. Um, I still haven't made back all of the losses yet. This was you know, nearly three months ago. But I've been trading with small size and I've been trading very meticulously and I still remember this trade. And this trade is arguably one of the most important trades of my career because it shows me and it shows you how slippery a slope it is where you can just somehow ignore all your trading rules. Blows my mind how I was able to do that. They tried to paint you a certain way when you arrived on the chopper, killer arrival. Yeah, I mean, again, I just don't care. Let the TV show paint me however they want. Um, you know, for, for me, it just, I, I'm just going to do what I want. And it was fun. I was in a helicopter mood back then. Not so much anymore. Now there's been a lot of helicopter crashes. Keep on asking questions, guys. Any questions you want, nothing is off limits. That's what it's all about here in the challenge webinars. Uh, lots of movers do not have news in stocks to trade outside of STT. Where do you get your catalyst? Uh, short sellers, you know? It's either news or short squeezes. Those are the main things for me these days. It's not you know, seeking alpha pro or premium anymore. Um, that's, that's dead to me. And it's, it's a dead strategy. But, you know, it, it really is crazy that you guys, so many of you still don't use stocks to trade breaking news. I, I would not trade without it. When I did trade without it, this is my loss. I traded without it. <laughs> and they were trying to alert me and I just didn't look at it. Pretty crazy. Um, why didn't you wait on any PT dip to after and buy pre-market resistant for dip buy? I don't know, Jason. I, I still don't even fully understand your question. I was, I was dip buying it here, you know, really well. Um, actually, you know, I, I like to see these giant spikes. I wasn't interested in it with the pre-market, even though it was spiking, even though it had the good news. And yesterday afternoon, um, it had, you know, some nice after hours. I was just so out of it from my long day of travels. I wasn't tempted to buy after hours. And then this morning, the action wasn't very good. Um, and I'm all messed up time zone wise. You know, it's, it's 1.19 p.m. Eastern. Um, and you know, you should think about everything in terms of New York hours because that's the U.S. stock market. But I was up at three in the morning this morning, um, and I have a crazy day, and I have to try to stay awake till like midnight. It's gonna be it's gonna be a struggle tonight. Um, New York time, 
Again, I always keep New York time wherever I am in the world. But, you know, when, when I'm tired, I'm not interested in anything. I don't care. You could show me the, the most perfect trade. I didn't want to trade. And then this morning when I was up pre-market, it wasn't looking very good. But once it started spiking and breaking out, I was interested. Um, I'm looking for, for stocks with range. That's the biggest thing that you guys can probably, you know, learn from is that I don't want boring stocks, you know, like this, I, I should have sized in more, but this was a fantastic trade, buying it at 27 on a dip, mind you, I was buying it right in here after it had already spiked to the 29s. So it had already proven that it can spike big and it was a breakout above 26. That was my risk level in case you didn't realize. I'm, I'm sorry, sometimes I have to type this stuff out, it's moving so quick, but it had broken the after hours resistance, which it touched twice at 26. So I'm buying it on a dip. I missed the initial breakout, but the good news is even if you miss the initial breakout, you usually get a second chance. And I got that second chance and I still sold too soon. You know, it, it went all the way up to 34 and I was out in the 31s. Uh, but this was a really good trade, you know, where I, I specifically am trading a stock with range um, and, you know, buying it just above a, a key breakout level. And, you know, I'm still down on the day. Like I'm still down 100 because DTSS, you know, I got a little stubborn yesterday, dip buying it like three times. Um, the first time was, was good. Second time was weak. Third time was worse. The worst of the three. So I'm still down, um, DTSS, I just had to cut it. Um, but it's okay, because I'm, again, I'm not focused on any one trade, like, oh my God, I have to be right, I have to be green on the day. It's all about what is your account doing in the long run, and are you sticking to your rules? And like I said, when I didn't follow my rules, I had the $27,000 loss, which change the whole trajectory of my trading this year where I'm trading extra small, but I've also quadrupled off the lows. So I'm, I'm happy that I'm back on the right track. Uh, J Ray says, thanks everyone. Base hit after base hit adds up. Avoiding big losses has been absolutely key. I agree. Chris Cruz just made 5% on TTOO. Good job. Just again, be very careful with these stocks that don't have a lot of range. Imagine if you bought the breakout. Imagine if you're like, it's a breakout above the morning highs at 51 and it goes to 53 and then, you know, 30 minutes later, you're down because you're buying a stock without that much range. You're buying a short squeeze that's already squeezed and you're buying into this long term downtrending stock. You're, you're trying to fight the trends. So not every breakout is created equal. How do I know all this? Because I have experience because I've been doing this for a quarter of a century. You'll start to understand the way that I think and you'll start to understand how the market thinks the more that you see this. Do you know how many failed breakouts I've seen over the years? WEC says, Tim, you're right a very high percentage of the time. Yeah, I mean, this is part of the reason why I got into teaching because most people in the teaching business, they're just full of crap. Let me actually tweet that real quick. I have to remind everybody, there's so many fakes in this industry. There are... This is what you guys have to understand. Like, if you, if you hear what others in the industry say about me. They'll say that I trade very cowardly and that I trade like a bitch. And it's true, you know? And, and I think that it's good to trade cowardly. And I know that being a coward in today's society is not a good thing. People look down on cowards, but I'm not saying in real life be a coward. I'm saying in trading, trade scared. The fact that I've made over $4 million and I only had that one really bad loss, um, you know, when, when I ignored all my rules, like in a decade, like that's pretty damn good. I didn't even realize it. Like I wasn't like, oh, I've gone a decade being disciplined. I only realized the error of my ways when I had the big loss. Read this out loud and retweet if you promise to trade scared. 
You guys have to understand there's more than enough volatility in this niche, in this industry than you need, okay? There's so much volatility. It's not a question of if there's gonna be another solid play. It's can you stay safe? Can you learn over time? And then can you find what patterns work best for you in changing markets? And then will you capitalize? Ah, uh, let's see. Kim's got this as I was just explaining to my wife that profits don't matter in the beginning. It's the process is the knowledge account. Good. I'm glad you get it. Never forget Jack Kellogg, who's coming up in one hour. He lost 2,600 year one. He might be over 12 million now. He just made 50,000 plus on TTOO earlier this week, but he lost 2,600 year one and he paid several thousand for the challenge. So he's down nearly $10,000 after year one. And this is like one of my top students. Think about that. Um, thanks, needed to hear that. I'm glad. Guys, if you have a small account, do not average down or up. Aim small, win small, or miss small. Agreed. I, I really think that there's a lot that you can learn by kind of being like this sniper in the woods. You know, like guerrilla warfare, just taking a little bit here or there. If you win, that's cool. That's a good gain. And, you know, you might not learn that much from your wins. If you lose, you learn what not to do, and it's a good lesson. Like, there's really no way to go backwards. But you guys think that a dollar loss is going backwards, and you think that a dollar gain is going forwards. That's not always the case. You might get lucky. You might take a low odd setup, and you win, and you're like, oh, I'm getting this. But you're not. You're actually learning the wrong lessons. A lot of people learn the wrong lessons in 2020 and 2021, thinking that they knew everything, and then the market changed and they got obliterated in 2022. So sometimes if you do cut losses or if you do take profits too quickly, it's a good thing. You protect yourself, you learn how to stay safe. Staying safe is a very underrated thing. Let's see how many of you retweeted this. Five people. There's 200 people in this webinar right now and five of you retweeted this. Think about that. In case you ever wonder, you know, why does Tim Sykes have so few millionaire students? Because I can't even get, not even 10% of you, which would be 20, I get about 4% of you to follow simple instructions. Think about that. Retweet this now, or you are not a good student. It's a simple task, and, and it's crazy how so many people want to be rich, but they can't follow simple freaking tasks. <sighs> um, what's your criteria for buying NASDAQ? Aren't you afraid of an offering? Yeah, I mean, I am always afraid of an offering, but, you know, I bought DTSS after they did an offering. <laughs> um, you know, that's always the risk. And I'm also trading with small size. There's always a risk of an offering. Very rarely will, you know, play like DTSS, do an offering, mind you, at double the current price, and then do another offering. But, you know, I was thinking that the catalyst would spike it. It didn't, so I was out. J2X says, can't get a flight for Vegas. Take the bus. Humble yourself and take the bus. Follow up to the question, when a stock is trading sideways and you exit quickly, do you have a set time limit? Um, just my level of patience. You know, like, you also have to understand, you don't see a lot of where I'm trading from. Like, I, hopefully there'll be a technology one day where I can just like live stream from all over the world and you could just see my crazy trading locations and my crazy travel schedule. Um, it's insane. So for me, no, I don't have a set time limit. Like, oh, I have to give this 15 minutes or sometimes I'm just tired. Sometimes I have very specific expectations for a stock. Like any PT was either going to be a big winner or not right away because I was going for the morning spike and sure enough, I got it. DTSS, I was going for the, you know, bounce, didn't get it. 
So for me, like, I, I either get it or I don't get it. It's, it's not like, oh, I didn't get it. Let me give it an extra hour. Because of my crazy schedule and being like jet lagged and tired, it actually helps me not overstay. I think that some of you have a tendency to overstay because you're like, well, psych says that I should learn from everything, but you don't learn from lack of discipline. Or I mean, you learn what not to do, but you know, you can't just hold and hope. On every single trade, you should have a decisive plan of action. When are you buying? When are you selling? What's the goal for you buying? What's the goal for you selling? I know some people say turn off like your profit and loss. Like a lot of my biggest students say like, yeah, just trust the chart. You guys don't have enough money or know how to trust the chart. Your account and your profit and loss should be your best friend. You're learning the process of trying to protect your account and trying to grow your profits. So I don't want you ever, ever turning off your profit and loss column. After you become a millionaire and you know you leave your training wheels behind, fantastic, do whatever you want. Uh, let's see. Can I ask a question about my job compliance with trading? I don't know. I don't know that stuff. I've never had a real job. If I did, I would suck at it. Um, so no, you can't. I mean, you can ask a question. I just, I won't know how to answer. I just wouldn't tell your boss. You know, I, you have to understand the, the way that I started trading was in high school and I was like skipping classes. I was pretending to go to the bathroom. In college, I took night classes. Um, you know, I, I always schedule my life around trading. I missed my college graduation for a trade. So you just have to decide, you know, how much screen time you're willing to give. Can you talk about how to confirm bottom on a dip? A lot of times I'm interested in buying the morning dip, but it consolidates three to five minutes, appearing to be the bottom and then swipes down. Yeah, I mean, I if I'm ever buying the dip and it doesn't bounce immediately, like you'll see me get out in minute one, minute two. And then sometimes minute three, minute four is when it actually spikes big. But I don't like that. If I'm buying an absolute panic, like, you know, I said this in the video lesson on TTO, I wasn't here for it. Um, but, you know, the, the day of the big panic, when it dropped from 70 cents at 9.37 a.m. And then this is at 10.03 a.m. and it's down to 42 cents. You know, you have a nice uh, 30 cent a share dip in like 20 minutes. There was a beautiful panic here, but I wouldn't have lasted from the, the bounce at 41 to the top at 60 and made 50%. I probably would have bought in looking at this as former support here at 41. So, you know, pretty close to that. I don't know what the level two was doing because I can't go back in time, but probably would have bought at 42, 43. I'm pretty good at, at catching the bottoms. And immediately, like in, like this is, 10.03 a.m. and this is 10.12 a.m. So within nine minutes, it jumps from 41 to 54. That's a nice, you know, 25% gain. That, that's all I would have taken. And I doubt I would have even made it to 54. I probably would have bought in at 41, 42 and out at like 48, 49 because I'd be scared of this being resistance. I don't even know if I would hold till 50 and I would lock in, you know, 15%. That 15% is near max for me. And this would have been just a few minutes. I wouldn't have lasted through the double bottom. I wouldn't have lasted for the 50% move. You just have to know yourself. And I've done literally thousands of morning panic dip buys. So even though I wasn't there for TTOO, I know what I would have done. I would have bought 25,000 shares at like 42 and sold the 25,000 shares at like 48 and made six or seven cents a share and made like 1200 or 1500 max. And that would have been one of my best trades because it was a perfect play. Uh, let's see, questions. Zach says, just started the challenge trying to go through the 30 day bootcamp, but want to learn more how to use stocks to trade. Email support at stocks to trade.com. They'll give you a whole curriculum. There's a lot, there's stocks to trade university. Chris Cruz says, thank you. I have to remember to be careful with these breakouts because it's going to bite me one of these days. Can't let some wins get in my head. Also, not every breakout is created equal, okay? Like I said, TTOO, technically it broke the morning high. But you're fighting this multi-day downtrend 
the markets tried to bounce and aren't really successfully bouncing, like you just have to have the right perspective. And I know as a newbie, you're not gonna have the right perspective because you just haven't been doing this long enough. So trust me, I have pretty good perspective. Um, look at this, Sarnod says, only taken nine trades this month and it's been my best month since I've joined the challenge, just focusing on one setup. Everyone, please congratulate Sarnod. Less is sometimes more. You know, this is the problem. So many of you take this trade and that trade and this trade and that trade and you win like 50%, 40% of the time and you're frustrated. If you learn to focus on just the best setups, you'll do better. But you don't know what the best setups are until you try a bunch of setups. So this is like the conundrum, you know? But I would say try different setups, whether you like morning panic dip buys, whether you like shorting first red days, whether you like buying multi-day breakouts, whether you like stocks to trade morning spikers, stocks to trade breaking news morning spikers with news, like try and, and see. But then after you've done, you know, testing the waters, whether you're paper trading a lot of plays, whether you're buying 100 shares of a lot of plays, you start to find what you're best at and you start to find what works best in the markets. I regret not buying PRAX. You know, this was stocks to trade breaking news, alerted it right here. It was at 116, 117. Stevie Cohen was buying it. I mean, this is a nice 30% runner. Um, and Agent, you know, was the other one. And this one didn't spike that much here. This was at 125, and now day two it's spiking. So Billionaire Plays, if you watch enough DVDs and video lessons, you go back, I used to buy Billionaire Plays. Um, having so many mentors in this program is great. I've been implicating some of Rob Booker's lessons since becoming a lifetime member. Focus on pre-market highs. Good. That's fantastic. And this is why you have multiple mentors. This is why, you know, all my millionaires get created in the challenge. This is why we now have the lifetime challenge because it takes a while to learn through all of the materials you now have access to. And I know I'm going to get this question email admin at timothysykes.com if you have any questions about Lifetime Challenge. It's tough sometimes to cram everything in, but if you start to say, wait a minute, I'm gonna learn for life, and you can choose you know, different months, different years where you're more dedicated. We're not going anywhere whenever there's opportunity. Thoughts on SBEV. I mean, it's just boring. It's not a big percent gainer. It's a terrible long-term chart. Again, you're, you're fighting these long-term downtrends. It's just a, a frustrating game. You know, I have no problem now. TTOO has reclaimed the breakout. So again, maybe it is the first green day. Maybe it closes strong. But I don't like, you know, this, this kind of setup. Um, I like morning panic dip buys. And, and because I missed it earlier this week, it's really tough for me to even think rationally. Because if I do buy it, am I buying it because it's a good setup or am I buying it because I want vengeance because I missed the perfect play earlier this week? Tupperware is coming down, 245. Yeah, I mean, so this is what I'm afraid of. Like Tupperware had a great squeeze here and then what has it been doing? Just gradually downtrending. This is short squeeze type action where it spikes from 215 to 275. This is, you know, 1040 in the morning. This is 1115. This is all inside of 30 minutes. And then over the past two hours, it's done nothing but downtrend. So recognize this is the time when you want to buy into these short squeezes. Congrats on all the school openings. Amazing. Any animal charities? Yeah, I mean, we also support like 15 or maybe even 20 animal rescue charities now. Um, so many different animals, so many different uh, issues worldwide. Um, you know, we've, we've also been filming this documentary now for nearly two years in Bali, showing the new schools, showing the new libraries. Now we're building homes. Um, and uh, it's crazy when you meet a lot of these families, and we're also feeding them too, and now clean water too. Uh, when you meet these families, you know, they're good people, but like they don't have education and, you know, they, they don't treat animals well. Um, 
You know, they're like Tim Bowen with, with no Wi-Fi. So I really think education is the future. You know, if we can educate these people to treat the animals better and treat, you know, the world better, if we can educate Tim Bowen to treat animals better and to treat the world better, I mean, there's a chance. I don't know. You know, I, I don't know how, how easy it'll be to educate someone from scratch or, or re-educate them. Um, you know, they, they get very set in their ways. You know, like if you ever talk to my parents, they're like older Jews and they get more and more stubborn. Like, don't try to change the mind of an old Jew. They just dig in. I don't think they can change. But we'll try. What would happen to any PT if the shorts cover would it spike? Yeah, I mean, if the shorts cover on any stock, it'll spike. But you just don't really see that price action. This is the kind of short squeeze price action you want to see. And look at this. This was right in the morning. This was from 9.25 in the morning to 9.45 in the morning. 20 minutes when it went up 50%. Aside from that, it's been straight down. So there's no indication that shorts are going to cover. In fact, this kind of price action is what shorts crave. You know, same thing with like Tupperware. This is a short squeeze right here. But then with this downtrend and no big squeezes, that's what shorts crave. TTOO is finally at least extending its breakout. But like, had I bought it earlier on that breakout and it, it would have failed, I would have been out. You know, if I bought this breakout here, which was one of the many reasons I didn't, and I don't suggest buying stocks at like 1 p.m., but like buying a breakout here from 51 cents to 53, and then it comes back down to 51, like 30 minutes later, I'd be out. I wouldn't last for this. And I just know myself. So you really have to, to figure out what you're good at and what you're not good at. And you do that through practice and you do it with, you know, just, just what you feel. And understand what works for you might not work for me. And what works for me might not work for you. We're all different. Just looking at stocks to trade breaking news. Apparently JTAI is spiking big. You know, and this is a tough tough chart to, to buy because it's this long-term downtrending play and the volume is light. But it's worth watching because it's a percent gainer. I think that no matter what your strategy is, you should focus on big percent gainers because then you can see, wait a minute, what caused the big percent gain? Was it earnings? Was it a billionaire? Was it a short squeeze? Was it a new AI press release? And it's, it's kind of cool to you know, see what, what gets stocks really moving. A lot of you guys just don't like fast moving stocks because they're scary and you don't understand them. So you gravitate towards slower moving or, or non-moving stocks. And then you're just frustrated because you're like, I don't know what's going on because you're taking unpredictable trades. If you take random trades, you'll get random results. You got Jack Kellogg coming up in 30 minutes. He's been, you know, going sideways, but I think that he's going to give a really good webinar because he just, you know, had a $50,000 plus profit on TTOO. Really nailed it. I mean, this is a, a perfect number four crash and a number five dip buy. This is straight out of the framework. Something that I created, you know, a decade ago, and it still works to a T. But thank you for joining in. Um, you know, thank you for being patient. Thank you for understanding that it's a marathon and not a sprint. Thank you for investing in your education and, you know, taking this seriously. Again, any questions about Vegas, about Lifetime Challenge, email admin at timothysykes.com. If you're confused about any play, it's okay. Keep going. Keep learning from the wins, from the losses. Don't try to ignore your losses and mistakes. In fact, spend more time thinking about your losses and mistakes. Learn what not to do. 
Don't be surprised if you screw up. You know, you might do some boneheaded trade like I do every now and then. It's not a perfect science. You're just trying to make more good trades than bad, and it gets easier over time. And you want to try to be maximum prepared for when there are good plays and when the market is better. It's cool that the NASDAQ is up 30% this year, but you know we're also down like 10% in just the last few weeks. So don't expect everything to happen overnight in the markets, in your trading career. Just keep learning and trying to get good enough so that when there is a perfect market or when there is a perfect play, all of your lessons, all of your struggling, all of your wins and your losses add up to you being prepared to truly capitalize. That's why I have so many new millionaire students because I reinforce these points. I taught through 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019. You know, Jack was in the challenge three years before his big years in 2020 and 2021. So you might be frustrated, you might be losing, it might be an annoying market, but you're learning. And all of this is gonna add up to helping you capitalize in the future if you have the right perspective, if you stick with it. So I'll see you guys in chat and I'm gonna, I'm gonna tune in uh, in 30 minutes to Jack's webinar too. It doesn't matter how successful you are, how many years you are in this game, you gotta keep learning. Never stop. I'll see you in chat.